in the state, and particularly in southwest Louisiana. Um, at, I say here it had over 500 members at one point. But Mossville is slowly dying. Not, And you'll see, if you take that drive along Old Spanish Trail, there is a great deal of land that's just sitting there. We'll see what happens to it. Sassol told me at one point that they thought they'd build a beautiful park. Well, okay. Um, and that's a thought, and it's a good thought. I believe in parks. But do you really want a park next to an industrial giant? Uh, I think not. So let's talk about was gone. Remember the two proponents of citizenry, land ownership and literacy. I think they go hand where to look. I didn't go into the day-to-day, -day, decade by decade growth in Mossville because it was very hard to plot. They're a community, a village, if you will. And they counted in the parish census, but it was hard to get my arms around the growth there. Um, it existed largely as an indigenous community sustained by sustenance farming. And you can have a good life like that if you know what you're doing back in the day. Um, you could farm, you could run cattle, pigs, sheep. The bayous were full of fish. There was fresh water everywhere. Um, and mostly, you got left alone. Okay? That's a good thing. That's what they want. That's still what they want. But it's been taken away from them. So rather than get into that sordid history, which I did, I identified six or seven people in Mossville, obviously still alive, that I could talk to about their experiences. The oldest living person in the book is Coach Williams, who was born in 1931. He is, he is a role model. Um, his parents were self-sustained. His mother had a car back in the day, which was very unusual for a black woman. And she would take black women into Sulphur to work all day and bring them home. That was her job. Coach's father formed, raised cattle, and taught Coach how to saw wood. That was his job. Back in the day, wood was used for everything, for baking, for heat, um, and it was prolific in Mossville. It still is. I mean, it's if you ride that train, and I hope you do, it goes through the deepest, blackest woods you ever saw. So you would think. There's no pollution here, uh, but there is. But getting back to Coach, and he is such an interesting guy. Um, when in Mossville, the highest educational level you could attain was fifth grade. That's it. You were 10 years old, and it was over. Coach's parents said, nope. No, nope, ain't gonna do. You're gonna finish high school. So his mama brought him across that bridge every day to go to high school here. They went right by Westlake High School every day. But Coach couldn't go to school there. So he finished high school in Lake Charles. He ended up living with an aunt. He calls her his auntie who lived in Lake Charles, and he used her address. Um, he was such a good athlete. He went to Grambling on a track and football scholarship. He was the first black student recruited by McNeese. The track coach couldn't believe it, that anybody was that fast. So it's the 50s, and we got this black athlete at McNeese. What in the world? Coach got drafted, went in the Army, was promoted to sergeant, thought he would 
make a career out of the service. His mama said, no, 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 forget that. You're going to come home, you're going to finish college, you're going to get an education. So he did. I always do, did what my mama told me. <laughs> Coach graduated from McNeese in 1960 with an education degree. He ended up being the principal and an educator at Mossville High School and then in integration in the mid-60s, and Coach says this in the book, when integration came, the school board decided to pluck the best black teachers out of the black schools and put them in the white schools. They decided that the, two, the teachers that were not so exemplary could stay in the black schools and teach black students. So Coach, in this great, huge circle, ended up at Westlake High School. And was loved. Beloved. <laughs> um, ask Hal McMillan about Coach Williams. His eyes roll back. So it's kind of an amazing sequence of events um, that that happened to him. But what I found in, all, in the research for the book and, and in getting to know the Mossville people is the ones I talk to are not bitter. And they have every right to be bitter. But they, they, they talk to me um, as cordially as you can to a white guy trying to figure out how their town disappeared. And I hope I made that message in the book. Um, the buyouts are over. People like Lenoria will never, she, Lenoria owns five acres in Mossville, right smack dab in the middle. She'll never sell it. She asked, so I asked and asked, she said, no, nah, keep your money. I'm going to keep my land. And she told me, and if you know her, she's a tough cookie. She said, Bill, I'm going to buy a trailer, a real nice house trailer, and I'm going to put it right back on my land in Mossville. So when my kids come to visit, I'll say, come visit me in Mossville. On land she inherited from her parents. She was a tremendous asset to me in discovering the nine families that founded Mossville and whose inhabitants for Ms. Rigmaiden, Ms. Rigmaiden is smiling because that's one of the pioneer families also and if you've never if you're ever in a, looking for a place to have lunch go to heaven on earth on Prater Road and get ready anyway her, her son Claude runs heaven on earth so it's 2019 um, I don't know what the population of Mossville is now, but it just takes five or ten minutes to ride through the entire town. Some people like Coach Williams will never leave, and Coach has a beautiful home. Um, he passed on the buyout, uh, he got whacked by Rita, he's not leaving, and he's at least 85 years old. I haven't done the math. He may be older than that. He is still on the Cockshoe uh, Parish Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, he is by far the oldest member. Um, and it's just an inspiration to me, as are most of the people in the book. Um, they were all willing to be interviewed. No one asked me to read the copy before it went in the book, particularly Coach. And I spent, I don't know how many hours with he and his wife. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, I don't know how things could have happened any differently. The pollution caused the revolution. There's no getting around that. The courts confirmed it. Um, Conoco and Condea Vista paid for the pollution, and you and you say, well, Bill, that's very coy. They paid for it. What? That's an incidental amount of money to them uh, in terms 
of their production of how much money they make every year um, and they took all those people land yeah they did and the courts fixed that but what Mossville has become to me is is a catalyst a catalyst of what can happen if we're not paying attention and we didn't pay attention there were no environmental laws back in 1941 and things went very slowly in my lifetime until we got a DEQ the Department of Environmental Quality and I believe in my heart of hearts that Willow Springs was the catalyst for the state and, and Governor Treen finally saying, okay, that's enough. We need a watchdog. And whether or not you, you trust state agencies or not, they're sure as hell better than nothing. And they regulate that industry to our west. Now, to give you a microcosm of Mossville, it is surrounded by 13 industries. Think about putting your home in the middle of that. Think about subjecting your children to that horrible sulfur smell that we used to wake up every morning to in Lake Charles when the, when the wind was out of the west. 13 industries circle their town. East, west, north, or south, there's no escaping the wind. I won't get into environmental degradation because I've probably hammered on it too much. This is supposed to be out about the history of Mossville. And I hope I've captured it. The school is gone. Sassol bought it and demolished it. The guy that owns it gets to do what they want to with it. It was a source of great pride for a long time to the people in Mossville. Susan has said we're going to have, or the Mossville History Project will have an open house at the Rig Maiden facility on Old Spanish Trail on Thursday. I hope you go. It's beautiful. It's a heck of a park. I'm not sure how many people go to it anymore, but it exists. And it's one of the little carrots that was doled out to those people. Um, kind of an incremental gift, if you will. But it's a beautiful facility. Um, I am not in. I am not indebted to Sassol, but they were very nice to me. And if you leave with one thought, it's that they didn't have to do this. They didn't have to buy those homes in Mossville. They didn't have to pay top dollar. And again. We all could conspire or think that's just chump change for Sassol. Maybe. They have to respond to their stockholders and they have to make a profit. And if you give people $75 million for land they're not going to use, what's the rationale for that? So it's, it's kind of an ongoing mystery to me. Um, but again, they were very nice to Miss Reed and myself. Um, and I think they're satisfied with what we did with their grant.